Okay. Um, by the way, some of you might have already tried to do the reading. Um, has anyone tried to do the reading? I noticed some of the words were cut off the top of the page, I think, for this week. My apologies. I didn't realize they, they must have screwed up the original or something. Um, I did check the Napoleon reading for next week. Looks like it's fine. Um, but for this week, yeah, I, it's just it's probably too late for me to get, I could go get the book again. I could try to get this done by um, Friday. Uh, but listen, if you have any questions, just please bring them Friday. If, if I can find the book, because I think it was from the library, but I'm not sure they have a copy. If I can find the book by Friday, I'll, I'll let you know and I'll try to leave another copy of it. But my apologies, I didn't realize it was cut off the top. Um, if anything is unclear from the reading, please come to class on Friday. Um, so we'll get to that page in a moment here. Yeah, where we left off, the king had opened this kind of essay contest, you know, essentially in the constitution of France, more or less. Um, a lot of people wrote in with suggestions, published pamphlets, and so on. The most famous of them and the most influential was the Abbé Siez. Now, as you would guess from his title, Abbé, he was actually a member of the clergy or the first estate. This was true, actually, a lot of the radicals of the French Revolution came from the nobility and the clergy. Um, this has always been true, I think, in revolutionary upheavals, in part because, as you would expect, I mean, to be really radical, you have to be educated or at least literate. You probably have to read. And a lot of the people who tend to read and be interested in ideas and public affairs were, of course, in the first and second estate, like the Abbé Siez. So he's not actually a member of the third estate. But his pamphlet famously is, oops, his pamphlet famously is called What is the Third Estate? Qu'est-ce que le tire état? The third estate, remember, being that of the commoners, the largest of the three estates. Now, it's a simple question. What is the third estate? It doesn't necessarily have a simple answer, though. I mean, after all, it could be just about anything. It could be everyone in the country who is not a member of the nobility or the clergy. You could also say, in a larger sense, it's the real country. I mean, if you look at the numbers, it makes up more than 90% of the population. Out of a population of maybe some 25 million, you're talking about about 24 million people. So you can very easily say, look, this is France. These other estates, the first and second, they have this prestige, but they don't represent much. And that's what C.S. basically said. I mean, then rhetoric, uh, pamphlets and, and public relations often come down to rhetoric and the turning of a phrase. And his phrase was essentially, what is the third estate until now? And he said, it is nothing. But what is the third estate in reality? It is everything. That was his phrase. So basically he said, look, we should let the third estate run the country. We should not really even listen to the first two estates. That's not literally what he said, but that's what he implied. Now interestingly, this becomes a very powerful idea. Like a lot of ideas, it kind of takes on a life of its own. Everyone doesn't just suddenly decide that the third estate will be France. But the idea begins percolating around in people's head. Now, where the kind of, the, the proverbial uh, excrement hits the fan is on this issue of vote by order versus vote by head. One of the great questions of how the thing will meet. Vote by order means just you have three of them. So the first estate, the second estate, the third estate, they all have a vote. There are three votes. The first two, ipso facto, can outvote the third. Vote by head means every individual member of the estates general gets a vote. Now, as it was actually elected, the third estate ended up having slightly more than the first two states combined. And then there were defections, people like Siez who came from the first estate but who ended up voting with the third estate. So in the end, the king decides on vote by head, which is almost like signaling that the third estate is going to run things. That said, the thing still does convene more or less normally with all three estates meeting on the 5th of May, 1789. It was convening, though, in very dramatic circumstances. I talked about all of these weather portents. It wasn't just a bad harvest, but it was one of those frigid, cold winters. There are all these echoes, if you look at like histories of the Russian Revolution, what happens in Petrograd right before that. 
Now, this really cold winter, and then suddenly it gets warm. That's what happened in Petrograd. In Paris, it was so cold, the Seine, the river through the middle of the city, actually froze over. You know, you could, like, walk across it. So by the time spring rolls around, you know, everyone has been freezing their buns off all winter. You know, food prices are shooting through the roof. So there are rumors swirling around about all kinds of things. You know, this is going to happen, this isn't going to happen. The people are going to rule, the people aren't going to rule. The king is going to let us rule, the king isn't going to let us rule. You have ample ground for speculation, percolation, and all kinds of intrigue and planning and conspiracies. Rumors are swirling through the air about this and that. No one really knows what's going to happen after all. This thing that is meeting hasn't met in 175 years. And a lot of people think the king is maybe going to change his mind. That maybe he's going to decide that parliament and popular government are not what he really wanted. So there are all kinds of rumors and counter-rumors going around. So first they meet, they decide on vote by head. This is partly they, they voted themselves, but the king has to make clear what his own view is. So they decide on vote by head, which means the third estate kind of gets a leg up. They don't control the thing yet, but they now have more or less a majority on most key questions. So you might think then that they will use this majority to push through, let's say, a new tax program. Now let's say they had done that. That probably would have been a good thing. But you remember how I talked about how revolutions in the modern era tend to spiral out of control very quickly. It turned out that most of the deputies were not interested in mundane things like public finance. It's this thing you have to keep in your mind because when you hear about the French Revolution and all these slogans like liberté, égalité, fraternité, you'll hear about all these terms, you'll hear about brotherhood, you'll hear about radical ideas and radical notions, and a lot of that was all true. But the thing which caused the crisis, remember, was public finance. The problem doesn't go away. Part of the reason it doesn't go away is because the people elected to deal with the problem don't actually deal with it. They prefer to talk about other things. They prefer to talk about the constitution of the realm and whether the third estate, as Siez said, really is everyone. And so while they are talking about some practical concerns, they spend their energy essentially planning, you might say, a political coup of sorts. Um, it happened in two stages. First, the third estate simply declared, look, we are no longer the third estate of the Estates General. We are the National Assembly of France. There was no precedent for this thing. I mean, in a way, they invented it out of thin air. It was like they took it from this guy's pamphlet. We are now the National Assembly, the Assemblée Nationale. They just declared it unilaterally. Declared a fait accompli. France was now presumably a constitutional monarchy, parliamentary democracy with a monarch that now had a national assembly. They just declared this. Um, neither one really knew what to make of it first. People in the first and the second estates, a lot of them, they saw which way the wind was blowing, and so they decided to get with the program, and they joined in too. Some of them didn't join in. Some of them left France. Uh, we usually refer to those who left as the, uh, oh, I wrote it down there, we'll get to that eventually, the emigres, you know, the ones who emigrated. Essentially, they leave thinking, look, things have gotten out of control, everyone's lost their minds. We will come back when the country comes to its senses and or when the country is invaded <laughs> so that we can restore uh, the proper role of the monarchy, etc., etc. Well, there is a kind of a, an initial skirmish for power. Um, the king and his advisors, and particularly uh, the royal, the French army, they begin, you know, at least kind of talking about whether they might have to go and depose this parliament by force. There are rumors in the air, and no one knows exactly who was responsible for the decision. But when they got to the meeting hall, the assembly room where they had been meeting the Estates General, which is also in Versailles, on the 20th of June, they found the doors locked. So that these people who have declared themselves a national assembly don't have a key to the door, <laughs> which is kind of a problem. And so famously, they go nearby to this, you know, kind of aristocratic tennis court. I mean, it was a slightly different version than the modern version of the game tennis that we play. And they all got together, and there's a famous painting by David, and they all, you know, said by acclamation, you know, we will not disband until France has a constitution. This is what is called the tennis court oath.
of the new self-declared National Assembly. Well, you have for a time almost like a kind of dual power structure. It's what the Russians called Dvaya Vlastia in 1917. The king is still there. The army still owes its loyalty to the king. Um, the States General has kind of ceased to exist now. You now have this thing called the National Assembly, which declares that it's sovereign over France. But on the other hand, it doesn't even have the keys to its own assembly chamber. But then you also have another factor which begins to play in here, which emerges at about the same time. And this factor, sometimes it's you use this term journée, which just literally means day, but it means a certain type of day, like a heroic day when the masses go out in the streets and start to affect things. Now, the first and greatest of the journées was, of course, Bastille Day, which happens on the 14th of July. Now, the genesis of this story in itself is a little confusing, like a lot of this stuff is. Again, there were rumors. No one knows the real truth. The king had supposedly assembled troops, you know, near Versailles, near Paris. So there were rumors that the king was going to depose the National Assembly, maybe um, impose martial law in Paris, essentially kind of go back to the old regime, reaction, etc., etc. No one knows really what the king was intending. The king might not himself know what, we, what he was intending, but the rumor got around, and so the mob decided essentially that they needed weapons, and they were somewhat misinformed. They thought they could find those weapons in the Bastille, which was a prison. Now, there were some weapons there, and they also thought it was a great symbol of royal authority, of despotism, where there were all of these political prisoners. As it turned out, there were only seven prisoners, you know, and I think... Like a couple of them were Czech forgers and the rest, a couple were just mentally ill, you know, sort of like mentally ill uh, patients or something. Anyway, it was not really what they thought. It is true the Marquis de Sade, you know the Marquis de Sade, he was once in prison in the Bastille. It was a symbol, not much more. You know, they, they killed the governor of the Bastille and they start this whole process where, you know, they put people's heads up on pikes, um, you know, waving around the heads of their, you know, their hated enemies, the oppressors of the people. And they kind of sort of then take over Paris in a way, the mob that is, basically. Um, now, the few things about this that are important, the reason it's still remembered and it's celebrated, of course, in France is their national holiday. I mean, something like their Independence Day. Um, I mean, I personally don't know if I would celebrate this as my national holiday. I mean, it was basically a riot. But basically it marked the moment at which the people at least as declared by the mob and whoever spoke for them took control of the capital from the king. The king would never really again have any control over Paris. Um, there were other things going on. They formed this thing called the National Guard um, which was meant to kind of defend the people of Paris from the king and his troops in case they tried to occupy the city. The National Guard, it wasn't really a, it wasn't a mob, it also wasn't an army, it was somewhere in between. It was like a popular militia, you might call it. Theoretically elected and accountable to the people, although in practice it was mostly controlled by, again, that nebulous class we usually refer to as the bourgeoisie. That is to say, people with property. You know, people who were... They were kind of on the side of this whole new National Assembly thing, but on the other hand, they had property, and so they didn't want the mob rampaging out of control. So for them, it's partly that they want protection from the king, maybe, but it's also that they want law and order. You know, they don't want the mob to take over Paris and go around looting and rioting. So it represents something like the merging of popular mob energy with the bourgeois spirit of the people who are trying to control the revolution. But meanwhile, the National Guard now essentially declares that, you know, we will control Paris, and then eventually they fan out and they form units in all the major cities. And they declare now that, you know, they swear their own loyalty to the National Assembly, you know, as opposed to the king. Now, the king kind of goes along with all of this. I mean, it's a bit confusing. You know, the king doesn't like most of this. Um, the king is not happy about most of it, but the king is not about to... Remember, he's just not a very strong character. You know, he's not someone who is going to go and impose law and order on Paris. I mean, he might have. That's one of the great what-ifs of the French Revolution. If the king had responded to Bastille Day, or preempted it several days before by sending troops into Paris to restore order, maybe things would have turned out differently. But as it is, the king essentially loses control. I mean, after... Bastille Day, he's no longer really sovereign. 
The National Assembly has more or less declared at least political sovereignty. The National Guard now is controlling law and order. The king still kind of, sort of has the loyalty of the army, but even that is wavering. So things start really spiraling out of control now. Um, against the backdrop of all of this, we have this phenomenon, I think I wrote it up here, it's usually called the Grand Pair or the Great Fear. Um, this is what is happening while all the political drama is happening in Versailles and Paris. Out in the countryside, again, the rumors there are even crazier. I mean, you know what happens to rumors, particularly among illiterate people. You know, like it passes from one mouth to another, and by the time it gets to the thousandth mouth, it's very different. And so now the rumors are, yeah, the king is going to destroy the people, um, but then maybe there are these criminals, and maybe there are these kind of like brigands who are going to rob us and steal us, and... And we, the peasants who were oppressed, want to uh, basically kind of like settle accounts with the nobles, but the nobles, they're arming these other people and they're going to kill us and blah, 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 blah. All these crazy rumors start flying around and inevitably it leads to kind of uh, a certain type of popular violence. Some of it is a tax on manor estates. Sometimes the peasants go looking for what they call evidence of, I think I wrote it here, Mortmain. This, I think I talked about the first week as one of these things which distinguished European feudalism from the Ottoman variety, the Timar system, that everything was hereditary. That is, that a nobleman could claim for generations, he and his descendants could claim a certain right on, you know, revenue or the labor of peasants. Now, serfdom as such no longer really existed, but there were still certain dues that peasants sometimes had to pay to noblemen. Um, now, oddly enough, the highest ranking noblemen didn't care about this stuff because they were rich enough they didn't worry about it. It was more like the, the petty lower nobles who would insist that, you know, this peasant owes me this annual sort of like tax or share of his good because of some document from 700 years ago or something like that. And so anyway, the peasants go looking for these documents. You know, they, they go inside the manor houses, they tear apart the place, they look for the files, they start burning this stuff. And all of this is happening spontaneously. Nobody's organizing it. You know, and obviously, this is beginning to worry not only the king and his advisors, but some of the kind of lawyers and businessmen who are themselves trying to control the revolution. And so, eventually, they put pressure on this new national assembly. And in this crazy, wild, euphoric atmosphere, on the 4th of August, they literally, as they call it, abolish feudalism. They take all of these laws, some of them dating back, as I said, hundreds of years. They declare them all null and void. Now, there are a lot of political implications to this. This is one of the most radical and important things about the French Revolution. The notion of equality before the law. That is, that the law will treat all citizens equally. Now, they don't take it all the way that far yet. Confusingly, they have this thing they call active citizenship and passive citizenship. You know, people who own property and pay taxes, they get to vote and run for office. Other people have the rights of citizens, but not the same privileges. But they want to get rid of that whole three estate thing. You know, they want to get rid of this notion that the clergy have a separate legal status, that nobles have a separate legal status, that there are any kind of personal or corporal obligations, like in the labor tax, that the poor have to the rich. They basically, they do the equivalent of what the peasants are doing. The peasants are burning all this stuff. You know, in the parliament, they just kind of declare it all null and void. They abolish feudalism. They get rid of all of the elements of Mortmain, all of these old traditions of the hereditary aristocracy, inherited privileges, and so on and so forth, exemptions from taxes. They get rid of all of it. You know, this all leads to what is sometimes called the great radical document of the revolution, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, on the 26th of August, 1789. <coughs> Now, it's kind of what it sounds. Notion of equality before the law, everyone has rights. But the language is a little different than, let's say, um, the American Constitution or Bill of Rights. This is something that particularly American historians have looked very closely into. That their notion of rights are rights held against the government. That is, in the American Bill of Rights, it's all your own right essentially to be protected from government interference. That is, you have famously the right to bear arms, although there's some controversy about it, the right that the government cannot illegally search you on the street or seize your property, 
Um, uh, there are other rights regarding legal rights. You cannot be tried for a crime, you know, that did not exist at the time the crime was committed. All these kinds of rights against the government. The French rights, they're a little more abstract than that. You know, they're kind of like, you know, we all have these theoretical natural rights, except the government also has certain rights. It gets very kind of slippery. They start talking about this notion of the volonté générale, Rousseau's notion, that is. And here's where the notion of individual rights kind of runs up against collectivism. That is, you have to read the text very closely. If you just read the summary of it, yes, everyone has rights, Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. But there's all this talk about stuff like the general will is manifested in you know, the legislature, or at the very least, the people's institutions. This notion of popular sovereignty. It's very, very political. And it can be interpreted in different ways. And rapidly is interpreted in different ways. I mean, it was really meant it was meant to douse the fires of radicalism. It was meant, again, by the same people organizing the National Guard, you know, the lawyers, the businessmen, the merchants. They like this idea of a new constitution, but they don't want peasants going around burning things up. They don't want the urban mob to kind of run riot. They're, they're sort of playing with fire, you might say. So they think that this document is, is going to be like their testament, saying, look, we're promising you equal rights, Although in reality, they're actually writing up a constitution so that, again, the rich have more rights than the poor. They're trying to, again, keep things under control. They're playing with fire. But they themselves lose control. Now, a couple of events. The most interesting and dramatic in the rest of the year, 1789, I'm not going to talk about this suspense of royal veto. Some historians think it's important, some don't. The king has a role. He's supposed to be a constitutional monarch who theoretically can veto legislation from the assembly. But they don't want his veto to be authoritative. It's confusing, but basically they're trying to have it all ways. They want to have a king, they want to have a parliament, they want to have natural rights for the people. But they also want to make sure that they can still control things, write the laws themselves. Um, they're starting to lose control. OK, so the most dramatic event, what we sometimes call the October Days, as I wrote there. The October Days. This is another one of those things, again, where rumor takes on a life of its own. There's a famous banquet held at Versailles. Now, the king is still there. You know, he hasn't left. He's still the king. But remember, the king's authority is no longer what it was. And the rumors being what they are, this banquet might have been a mistake. Um, it was very sumptuous and lavish, the spread of food and so on. So there were rumors about it, some of which reached Paris. Now, the most famous rumor, which you might have heard, is that supposedly Marie Antoinette, who, remember, comes from the Habsburg clan, so she's Austrian, so she's a foreigner. She also supposedly sort of dominates her husband, so there's an element of kind of resentment and misogyny there, too. She supposedly says when she's told that, you know, the people of Paris are having trouble affording bread, she says, well, let them eat cake. <laughs> now, she never really said this. It's just one of those things that they made up. But like a lot of apocryphal remarks, the fact that people thought she said it was probably more important than whether or not she did say it. Because the combination of this remark and the fact that, remember, food prices have been spiraling out of control, rumors are rampant, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, meant that the people who had to spend the time waiting in line for bread when it was scarce, who had to pay the inflated prices, who would often have to stand out in the cold. By now, you know, it's October, so it's cold again, like it was the previous winter, not as cold. Who are these people? Well, they're women mostly. Um, they're not all housewives. I mean, some of them work. But the basic idea is, you know, these are the women who are taking care of, like, the household chores, who have to go buy the bread and wait in line and do all of this stuff while, who knows, I mean, maybe their men are working. Maybe their men are just off, you know, sitting in cafes the way men sometimes do. It was literally an army of women, an army of angry women, fed up, pissed off, resentful, and particularly resentful of Marie Antoinette. I mean, there's always this funny thing about this, like, in, in recent Soviet history, you know, in the Gorbachev era, I remember there were all these people who got angry in the Soviet Union that, you know, Riza Gorbachev, the wife of Gorbachev, got to go to these international conferences and she wore, like, you know, furs and nice clothes. And, and they all started saying, you know, who elected her? 
which is kind of funny because nobody elected Gorbachev either, right? <laughs> but they're angry at her for some reason. I don't know what it is. It's some weird thing in human nature. Well, they resented her more than they resented the king. Maybe because she was a foreigner. You know, maybe because she was the one who, you know, wore all the jewels. But anyway, it's the women, and the person they're angry with is a woman, Marie Antoinette. So they literally march to Versailles. Now, some of you might have been to Paris. You, you speak French. You've probably been to Paris. Have you? No. Has anyone been to Paris? Have you been to Versailles? Yeah. So you remember how far it was? No, no, how far from uh, Paris? Yeah, it's a long way to walk. Yeah, with the metro, but they didn't have the metro back then. <laughs> they walked. They walked all the way from Paris. They walked 20 kilometers. And they surrounded the palace, and they took the king and queen hostage. An army of housewives literally took over the palace, arrested the king and queen, or they didn't arrest them. I mean, theoretically, they went and they kind of sort of were, you know, awed by royalty and all of the rest of it. But then they said, look, you know, we want to bring you back with us to Paris, you know, basically because we don't trust you. So they bring the king and queen back to Paris, an army of housewives. You can see what I mean about kind of losing control of events. No one is really in control anymore. I mean, the elites who were behind this National Assembly idea, many of them themselves from the aristocracy or the clergy, you know, they're sort of, again, they're exploiting the popular mood, but they're also now beginning to worry about the popular mood. And so on the one hand, again, you have this, this new sort of mob authority, the notion of the journée. This is when some event will happen, the people take to the streets. A journée, again, meaning literally a day, but it's like a a heroic day, you know, a day when the mob gets involved in politics. Uh, the first was Bastille Day. You could say the 5th of October when the housewives go to Versailles, that's the next. There are many more to come. Um, we're not yet to the sans culotte. I'll talk about those in a moment. But the idea is like this toxin bell would ring, the mob would go out, and someone would, you know, stir them up. And so, okay, so they're becoming a factor. The Parisian mob is very important. The assembly, again, they're beginning to be a little bit worried about this. In fact, the mob makes it clear, and as part of this bringing back of the king and queen to Versailles, they now make clear that they don't want the parliament to meet there either, because Versailles, remember, is 20 kilometers away from Paris. So the, the assembly begins meeting in Paris too, which means that from now until, well, basically when, when Napoleon starts taking over, Every public authority, every assembly, and there are a lot of them, they keep changing their names, is essentially kind of under watch. That is, they're being watched and observed by the mob of Paris. It's like a major factor in politics. Again, they themselves don't want to be that radical yet, though. Uh, it's confusing, but the National Assembly becomes the Constituent Assembly. Constituent meaning they're writing the Constitution. Now, once they've written the Constitution, it becomes the, uh, where did I write it here? The Legislative Assembly. That's from 91 to 92. The most important of them all, though, the one you should remember, I'll talk about on Friday, and that's the National Convention. That's the most dramatic of them all. But anyway, so they're changing their spots. They're writing a Constitution. They're trying to harness the popular fury, but they're also trying to control it. Okay, so a couple of things they do that are very important. Uh, you have, first of all, this notion of active versus passive citizens. I talked about this. The active ones are those who have property and pay taxes. This is their way of supposedly keeping control. You know, they will not give the vote to the poorer citizens. One way of keeping control. But remember, they themselves are still facing the financial crunch that the monarch had faced. And they don't really know how to do this either, because remember, they don't want to anger the mob, and so you know, they're not really sure they want to raise taxes either. Yes, they will now tax everyone equally, but on the other hand, to really get finances under control, they, they would have to raise taxes for everyone, and they don't want to do that, because everyone's afraid of the mob now. So what they come up, instead, come up with instead is a very clever, oh, not that one, uh, it's up here, a very clever sort of a coup. A financial political coup. Not unlike what Henry VIII had done in England, you know, saying, we'll be Protestant now, we'll take over all of the Catholic property. 
they do it in a slightly more subtle way. What they say is, look, we're not just going to steal all of the church lands and monasteries and abbeys and convents. What we'll do is we will declare the church lands and property to be national goods, bien national, kind of like national property. And then we will issue new bonds. They're kind of bonds based on the value. They call these asinia. And we will raise money in this way. But you see, these bonds, which we will use in part to raise funds just for ordinary expenditures to pay off debts and so on, they will now be backed by something. They're not just backed by our promise to pay them back. They are literally backed by the church property. It sounds very sound. And it might have worked well. But there are a couple problems with the way they did it. Now, it's complicated because theoretically they're issuing these bonds on all of the church property. But then they also took individual things and sold those for cash. So theoretically, then, they should have reduced the number of assignats in circulation, which they didn't do. And so inevitably, the value of these things starts to plunge. You, know, you get inflation. Just like with the government bonds, people are buying and selling them as if they're real currency, and their value starts to drop. But as a political move, though, it was very clever. Because again, you're focusing the the resentment of sort of the mob and the poor against the rich church. Then they also decide to take it a step further and they issue something they call the civil constitution of the clergy. What this basically means, you remember that the clergy of the Catholic Church, I think I talked about several weeks ago the Canossa incident. This is when the Saxon king had gone and bowed down before the Pope. The issue then, if you remember, was who would appoint bishops. The Pope and Rome appoint bishops, and that's where you got this kind of separation of church and state, you know, even before the Protestant version, which was more radical. What the French revolutionaries do is very radical in and of itself. They now say that members of the clergy are no longer supposed to be taking their orders from Rome. They must swear allegiance to the new constitution of France. So it's, it's like a political, what we call a litmus test, or a loyalty test. And any member of the clergy, of whatever rank, who refuses this will be called refractory. That is, they will be essentially sort of, not exactly excommunicated in the way the pope would do it, but they are now told that they no longer have their offices. Their salaries will now be paid by the state. So that, in essence, the employment of these people is also now a national matter. So this is the way of asserting control over the church. Um, partly, again, for financial reasons, partly for political reasons. Now, they're doing other things, too, some of which are very sensible, at least in theory. They're changing the administrative nature of France. They go from these kind of large, unwieldy Provence or provinces to départements, which are supposed to have proper geographic boundaries, and there are like 83 of them. They're writing the constitution that I talked about they're starting to talk about these long-term plans, again, for the economy, for finance, equality before the law, and all of this. All of this stuff, again, it seems sensible, a lot of it. Um, it's not too radical. They're trying to keep things from getting too radical. But there are a couple of factors working against them. That is, the legislators you know, who are trying to draw up a constitution. Now, the biggest of these factors is the whole problem of the king. Now, as you can imagine, the king was not terribly happy about being taken hostage by a mob of angry housewives. <laughs> Nor that his wife, Marie Antoinette, you know, whatever the nature of their life in the bedchamber, uh, she is now not only hated and resented and denounced by everyone, but I mean, they lit it's, it's nasty stuff. You know, they all call her like the Austrian bitch hound and all of this stuff. You know, the popular press says horrible things about the queen. They say things which are not that much less horrible about the king. And they are now kind of hostages. Um, they are held in the Tuileries Palace. If you've been to Paris, you know roughly where this is. Yes, he is sovereign over the country, theoretically. The Constitution says he's a king, and he even has a kind of veto power over legislation, although it's suspensive, meaning it's kind of sort of a veto power. But the king is also, as I said, very unhappy. And not only is the king unhappy, but there are a lot of other monarchs which are also unhappy about the way the king is being treated. There are also all of these emigres that I talked about, you know, particularly noblemen, some of whom have a claim on the throne. Uh, most famously, the, the Comte d'Artois, 
who was uh, the Count of Artois. He will later emerge as a king, you know, in the Restoration. What's interesting about him, there are two things. You know, one is that he was a notorious rake. That is, he seduced a lot of women, and so everyone knew that, well, shall we say, uh, he wasn't impotent. And the other is that he was a hardcore reactionary, you know, a true absolutist. Um, he had, again, he had a kind of claim, he was part of the Bourbon family, but he wasn't in the direct line of succession. But a lot of people say if he had been the king, you know, then things would have turned out very differently. Well, he was one of the first to emigrate. And so he kind of leads the conspiracies of the various emigres. You know, they go to these various courts in what we now call Germany, or what was then still called the Holy Roman Empire. You know, they hook up then with you know, the various notables in places like Prussia and Austria, they start talking to both the king in Prussia and Austria. They start talking about how things have gotten out of control and we must do something. Now, theoretically, they're not saying Louis XVI has done anything wrong. They're saying he's like a hostage, right? They're saying, you know, look, he's a hostage. And so, you know, we need to get messages to him. We need to get him out of France so that we can do something to restore the proper authority of monarchy. Because after all, as we all know, the precedent of revolution, the precedent that they set, the kind of waves which flow out from them can ultimately affect other states, states as far away as the Ottoman Empire. Uh, we'll talk more about the foreign effects of the French Revolution next week. But for now, the point is that the king himself started to entertain similar ideas. He almost certainly had various avenues of communication with the emigres, and the courts outside France. He must have, because the king actually tried to leave. This is the event we usually refer to as the flight to Varennes, which is kind of a misnomer, because he wasn't trying to go to Varennes, which is still in France. He was trying to leave France. Varennes is where he was caught. Uh, and yet another of his kind of endless blunders of stupidity. <laughs> He didn't stay in the royal carriage. Um, I don't remember why he left. I mean, maybe he just wanted to stretch his legs or get some fresh air or something. But when they got to Varennes, you know, he got out, he kind of strolled around a little bit. Now, everyone was supposedly in disguise, you know, the king and Marie Antoinette, you know, and all the royal attendants of the bedchamber, etc. Um, but the king hadn't disguised himself properly enough because he was recognized. And so they caught him. And they sent him back to Paris. So it was almost like for the second time the king was taken prisoner. Only this time. The first time he was taken prisoner sort of in a friendly way. You know, like the mob of housewives had said, look, you know, we're angry with your wife. But, you know, I suppose you're okay so long as you don't misbehave and come back to Paris. This time, it's like he's a criminal. He's like literally trying to flee the country, even though he's the sovereign of the country. And so this time, there's really no doubt about where his loyalties lie. I mean, there's still arguments about his intentions. Did he really want to go and, you know, lead an army to reconquer his throne? No one knows for sure. It's true there were plots, and he must have been somehow abreast of them. But the fact is, from this moment forward, this is in June of 1791, there's kind of like an undeclared civil war between the royal house and the revolutionaries. Even though, theoretically, again, he's still sovereign, he's still king. Um, and I mean, he, after this point, he actually behaves very well. You know, he kind of expresses support for everything the parliament does, yada, yada. He's on his best behavior. But that said, everyone is on their guard. And so famously, you get this thing called the Declaration of Pilnitz. This is um, the Prussians and Austrians. Yeah, more or less, they're just declaring that they're worried about the king. They're worried about the fate of the king. You know, anything that happens to the French king, after all, could set a precedent for other kings. Now, people might get ideas. You could get seditions spreading around Europe, mobs, you know, uh, Bastille Day in Berlin or in Vienna or where have you. And so they say we're concerned. Now, it's one of these things that kind of has the opposite of the desired effect. You know, they, they want the revolutionaries to behave and to start properly obeying the king, whereas instead, of course, the revolutionaries just get angrier and angrier. The Declaration of Pilnitz serves as a kind of pretext for the new assembly. This is after they pass the Constitution, and so it's called the Legislative Assembly. And they now declare war on Austria. This is in April 1792. Now, there, there are a couple things going on behind the scenes. You know, one is, okay, they may have a pretext, right? Prussia and Austria have kind of declared that they sort of want to intervene, or at the very least, they've kind of subtly threatened 
the revolutionaries. You also have the emergence of what are usually called political clubs. Uh, the most important of them was the Jacobins. Um, something of a misnomer. That's not what they called themselves, but that's what eventually people called them. It's a little confusing. They're not a political party exactly. They're sort of like, again, they're like a club of like-minded people who get together to talk about politics. But they do become something like a faction. Um, there's a sub-branch of them called the Girondin. This is just the part of France that they're from. And confusingly, the Girondin are supposedly the more moderate of the Jacobins. They're the ones who, in the National Convention, we'll talk about that on Friday, are so-called so on the right. This is actually where we get our language of left and right from. But at this point, they're still kind of radical. You know, everything keeps going further and further left. So even though pretty soon they're going to be on the right, right now they're on the left. And the reason they're on the left is because they have these kind of uh, romantic ideas about spreading the revolution beyond France's borders. Expansionary war, basically. They don't put it that way, but that's pretty much what they're saying. We need to spread the revolution outside France, because otherwise the revolution will die because the monarchs will team up against this. It's like preemptive war, sort of. So they declare war in Austria first. Now, it's important to remember that, because revolutionary propaganda, even to this day, tends to kind of underemphasize this fact, the fact that France declared war, not Austria, not Prussia. It was the French who declared war. And there were dissenting voices. Oddly enough, among them was Robespierre. Robespierre, who is, of course, known as the most famous of the kind of Rousseau radicals, he actually did not support the motion to declare war in Austria. He had a very interesting phrase. He said, no one likes armed missionaries. Now, that is people who are trying to convert other people, right? Whether you're trying to convert them to Christianity or to Islam, or in this case, to a new kind of politics. You know, we're saying, well, we're freeing you. We're going to break your chains so you'll be free of the chains of feudalism. Well, yeah, but that also means that the French army is going to occupy you and, you know, take your livestock and maybe burn down your farms and so on. This is, of course, eventually what the French do. And Napoleon turns out to be very good at it. Um, so the whole thing begins, you know, with a kind of idealistic notion of protecting the revolution. That's at least the way the Girondins see it. So they declare war in Austria. And here's where you get this kind of one-upping effect. Remember, first Austria and Prussia have declared an interest in the fate of the king. Then the assembly declares war on them. And so then what you get in response is a declaration usually called the Duke of Brunswick's Manifesto, which runs something like this. Towards the end of your reading for this week, if you have seen it, it's on page 112. The threat is, and I quote, if the Tuileries Palace, that is where the king and queen are now held hostage, is attacked by deed or word, if the slightest outrage or violence is perpetrated against the royal family, and if immediate measures are not taken for their safety, maintenance, and liberty, then the city of Paris will witness, quote, a model vengeance never to be forgotten and the persons responsible for the disorders against the king and queen will be handed over to the tortures which they have so richly deserved. That's quite a colorful threat. Basically, keep your hands off the king and queen. So anyone want to guess what the mob of Paris does next? They put their hands on the king and queen. Well, I think that's a pretty good place to stop because I think we're more or less at the end of the hour. Um, but we will pick up then on Friday with what I call the second French Revolution, um, beginning, that is, with the mob truly taking over in 1792.